I'm going to, to show you guys uh, today is just a quick introduction to organic photovoltaics and also to one of the, the primary spectroscopic techniques that we use to look at OPV and perovskite materials, which is transient absorption spectroscopy. So organic photovo uh, photovoltaics have been around for, for a while and they're still very much of interest, uh, largely because of the versatility of functionalization, which means that we can look at, um, we, we, we can design any kind of molecule essentially that we want. And also they have very, very short energy payback times, um, very competitive with, with many other uh, photovoltaic technologies that we have. And in fact, organic photovoltaics have been undergoing a bit of a renaissance recently, and this is largely due to the rise of non-fullerene acceptors. So um, fullerenes uh, such as PCBM, um, the device efficiencies of these uh, have been stagnating in recent years. But just in the last um, several years, non-fullerene acceptors, such as the molecules uh, shown there on the left, um, have essentially produced a meteoric rise um, in, in OPV efficiencies. Um, as you can, you can see on this, this graph on, on the right here. And in fact, just this year, we've seen single junction organic photovoltaic cells approaching 18% uh, efficiency. And just a few months ago, um, we have actually achieved over 18% efficiency. And this is very exciting. And one of the, 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 the great hot topics um, of OPV at the moment is looking into why these non fullerene acceptors are so good and how they can give us such efficient devices. So this is a very um, typical ver uh, view of, of how an organic solar cell works. We um, generate a singlet state uh, via absorption of a photon of light from e by either our donor molecule or our acceptor molecule. And this is often called an exciton, a bound electron hole pair. Now in the presence of an acceptor, we undergo an electron transfer to that acceptor. But because of the low dielectric constant of organic materials, the electron holes still remain quite tightly bound and we call this an intermolecular charge transfer state. Now this can then undergo full charge separation to produce free charges, the charge separated state. And these are often called polarons, which is essentially the charge coupled to the structural deformation of the molecular structure around it. Now this is very much the conventional view of how an organic solar cell works. And you can see that we've got quite a large energy gap between our S1 state and our charge transfer state. But in fact, our most efficient non-fullerene acceptors operate with a much smaller energy gap between our S1 and our charge transfer state. And we can see this a bit more clearly if we move from a, the state picture to more of an energy level picture. And you can see the picture on the left here is what's a conventional way of looking at things, a large lumen offset, where essentially we have a large driving force for charge separation which has often been linked with higher levels of, of charge density, charge generation. Um, however, this isn't an ideal situation because this typically leads to losses in voltage because the voltage of an organic solar cell is related to the difference in the HOMO of our donor and the LUMO of our acceptor. So one of the things that people have been looking at very recently, in particular with regard to these non fullerene acceptors, is to minimize this LUMO offset. And you can see that this then enhances the, the, the maximum voltage that you can get, but does it minimize the charge photo generation that we can get? But interestingly, it seems that we're still able to get this efficient charge generation. And one of the things that have been looked at by a lot of people recently and right now at the moment is why we can get this efficient generation with such small energy offsets. And interestingly, this happens not just for the non-fullerenes, but also in fact for fullerenes as well. So this is a, a very much a hot topic and we're going to see some, some work about this um, during, during our conference today um, and later in the week, I believe. So I also want to introduce to you transient absorption spectroscopy because this is one of the, the, the great tools that we have at our disposal to look um, at these at all these different uh, species that we can form during uh, photovoltaic device um, operation. So TAS, or transient absorption spectroscopy, is an optical pump probe technique um, that enables us to monitor the change in absorption or the change in transmission of a photogenerated species. So one of the great advantages it, is it has is that we are able to look at the full gamut of time scales from femtoseconds all the way up to milliseconds, which enables us to look at virtually every single process that happens in a solar cell. So it essentially works by a pump pulse, which excites our sample, 
and um, generating our transient species of interest, which is then interrogated by a probe light that is delayed in time, uh, either electronically um, or via a delay stage. And then we essentially detect that change in absorption, either as a function of wavelength to get a spectrum or as a function of time to get the kinetics. So this is often what we see um, when we look at our absorption uh, spectrum, uh, where we get essentially our excited state absorption and a ground state bleach. Um, and one of the most useful things about transient absorption spectroscopy is this ability to look at the kinetics, essentially, essentially to look at the efficiency of how one species converts into another. And by looking at the efficiencies of these processes, that gives us information about how our solar cell works. So that's a very brief summary of, of transient absorption spectroscopy. My, my postdoc, Jose Marambalaki, has actually put on the NanoG website under educational resources an online tutorial for how transient absorption spectroscopy works um, with relation to organic solar cells. So if you're interested, um, please, please have a look at the NanoG uh, website. So that's the very uh, simple version of transient absorption spectroscopy, but a lot of people have been tweaking our transient absorption in order to gain extra information. And one of the, the very clever ways that this is done, for example, is using pump push probe spectroscopy. And essentially the idea here is introducing a third beam, uh, often a low energy near infrared or infrared beam that essentially pushes your charged transfer state up its vibrational manifold, giving it a little bit of extra energy to enable it to dissociate more efficiently. And then by comparing this with the pump probe, the standard pump probe, you're able to look at essentially how many charged transfer states you have, which has been very, very valuable um, in assessing uh, organic solar cells. And the science article by Artem Bakalin and Richard Friend is, is a great example of this. Another um, related spectroscopy of, of that's very much of interest is uh, electronic spectroscopy in the two dimensions. And essentially this involves looking at the correlations between your excitation energies and your emission energies and looking, look for energetic coupling between the two. And this gives us huge amounts of information on electron transfer and also energy transfer. And this paper by Gregory Scholl's group is, is a great example of that. Electro uh, ele uh, sorry, uh, Ultrafast spectroscopy has actually been, been really pushing the boundaries in the last few years and going in directions that, that have never previously been possible, which is fantastic. And one of the ones that uh, has recently captured my imagination is population controlled impulsive vibrational spectroscopy, which enables us to look at background free Raman spectroscopy of ultrafast generated excited states. And this is an example being looked at by Philip Kukura's group in Oxford and also um, the Tahara group in Japan. And essentially what this enables us to do is it gives us the holy grail of both structural information and dynamic information simultaneously. So these sorts of technique, new techniques will enable us to look even deeper into organic soil cell materials than has previously been possible. So in terms of the photophysics side of things, um, we also get what's called triplet states um, in organic solar cells um, on, on every now and again. Um, and this is typically being considered a loss mechanism, but recently people have been starting to manipulate their properties and use their unique characteristics in order to achieve beneficial things. And there's a whole variety of different ways that we can do this. For example, this one here shown here is photon up conversion, where essentially you uh, excite your donor. You typically have a heavy metal involved so you can get efficient interstitial crossing. And then you get a triplet energy transfer to a lower energy triplet which then undergoes triplet-triplet annihilation, and you essentially end up with a higher energy singlet from where you started. So essentially what this enables you to do is to capture low energy photons and turn them into higher energy photons. And for example, in an intermediate band gap solar cell, you could essentially inject this higher energy directly into an electrode. Another uh, way of, of, of using these triplet states is in with singlet fission. And I found this great um, picture by and a paper by Henning Seringhaus and Jenny Clark. And you can see uh, essentially here how, how singlet fission works. And essentially what singlet fission is, is it's a two for, price, for the price of one, where you start off with a single singlet state and you turn it into two triplets via this entangled um, triplet pair. And this is a very uh, fast process 
But the fact that we end up with two excited states when you started with one means that you can essentially use the energy from both of these. And this has been um, used to enhance the efficiency of organic solar cells even further.